Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Astronomy on Tap. Thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, my name is Yair. This is Andy. We'll be your host this evening. And for those of you who it's your first time or don't remember exactly how this works, uh, Andy's going to walk you through what's about to happen. All right, so we'll start with a talk from Rebecca, uh, visiting all the way from the University of Texas. And uh, we'll introduce her in a bit, but then we'll have a five minute break. And then uh, we'll uh, have text your questions to 805-55-AOTSB, uh, and we'll answer them after the return from the break. Then we'll have astronomy in the news and then another break, and then Yair is going to give us a talk. Special treat. <laughs> <laughs> then we'll tell you about upcoming events. Remember to text your questions again, okay? We'll tell you about upcoming events, answer your questions in a raffle. But, okay, that is what's on the program. Really, I also want to say that this is, Yair hosted, uh, started this event here and has organized everything about it and, and hosts every week and often gives talks. This is his last event, hosting and so on. Now he'll be at the next one, but he's not hosting anymore. So, uh, but as it is a special event, there will be special, a special surprise and things he doesn't know about. Okay, uh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, keep that in mind when you see him wandering around, you know. Let's, uh, for the last two years, he has done an amazing job uh, hosting this thing. Right. Thank you. Okay, now, now I'm nervous because I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> you know, I, when we do these events, I plan every detail, and so this, this is unprecedented. I don't know how I'm going to deal with this. Yeah, it's very OCD. It's taken a lot yes? to hide things. And from proud us. of it. Yes, yeah. uh, yes. Uh, Okay, so um, the text your questions thing is text your questions about the talk. Don't just text us random questions. Um, this happens. Um, if you do have do random it. questions, we'll let you know what to do with them later. But for the talk, text your questions about the talk to this number. And if we select your question on stage, you get a prize. So if we select your question, you can see our friend Sandy at the front desk where you entered, and she'll give you, you can choose one of these posters or any other NASA memorabilia stuff we have up there. Um, and if you're a student and we select your question, you can pick two things um, from what we have up there for you. And uh, today we're starting something new. If you're wearing anything astronomy related, like your Astronomy on Tap t-shirt or anything astronomy or science fiction related, you get a free poster too. So go see Sandy in the front. Okay. All right, also, um, to keep Astronomy on Tap going, it does cost us uh, money to put this event on, uh, but we like to keep it free, no charge to come in, because we want to encourage students and young people to come. Uh, so if you do have the means to keep uh, supporting us, there will be tip jars going around. Uh, and as always, we have a competition. Yes. Uh, well, maybe before I, we get to the competition, let's just say that what does this go for? It goes for things like uh, sometimes we have to rent furniture, we have to put ads to uh, make sure people know about it, we uh, pay for drinks for the people putting on the show, and uh, volunteering, and so on. And so, again, there are many expenses, but we're, we're just trying to break even here uh, and to keep it free for everyone. But now, as always, a competition. What do we have uh, for our competition this week? We have the James Webb Space Telescope versus <laughs> The Hubble Space Telescope. So, yeah. yes, vote by tipping. The jar with the most tips wins. And, well, there's, it's like not obvious choice here. There's no competition. This is a competition between, you know, some, uh, Joey, who is, helps us organize astronomy on tap, mentioned this is like a competition between a horse and a unicorn, okay? <laughs> unicorn is nice, but it's not there real yet. So, 
Oh, but come you on, know. Yair. This is the future. The James Webb Space Telescope is going to blow away the puny little Hubble Space yeah. Telescope. Yeah, well. Because its mirror is six meters instead of two. All right. Yeah. Well, which one is producing data now? So. Yeah. You could we'll have said see. the same thing about uh, some little tiny telescope <laughs> 30 years ago. Okay. Well, so Hubble Space Telescope versus James Webb, we will keep. Um, Recommending what you should vote during this well, event. Well, yes, there will be uh, bits of information that may influence your vote. Yeah, and so the tip charts will be uh, wandering around, and during the breaks, they'll be up in the front desk. So if you want to re vote or, or didn't get the tip jar, uh, see Sandy at the front desk during the break uh, as well. Okay. Yeah. So. All right, so uh, <laughs> also another way to support uh, this event is there's Astronomy on Tap t-shirts at the front that you can buy for the price of only $10. And, uh, you know, when we see people around town wearing Astronomy on Tap t-shirts, it makes us feel good, all right? So uh, keep uh, helping us uh, advertise this event and uh, look awesome at the same time. Yeah, and so an Astronomy on Tap t-shirt also qualifies as an astronomy-related clothing, so you would get a free poster if you wear it Keep as well. the swag snowball going. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you'll notice some of us have these uh, nice glowing star pins, and there are people in the audience with star pins. These are all astronomers or observatory staff. Uh, that's where you direct your random astronomy questions to. Feel free to ask anyone with a star pin during the breaks or after the event anything you want to know about astronomy or our observatory or what we're doing here. So just, you know, they're, they're wearing the pins so that you recognize them and, and can talk to them. Okay, I think we're ready to get started. Sounds good. All right, our first speaker tonight is Rebecca Larson. Uh, I've known Rebecca for a number of years. In fact, she in some ways is responsible for this whole event getting started. Yeah. So uh, I, uh, she invited me to come give a talk at Astronomy on Tap Austin, and uh, so I did, and it was amazing. And I came back and said, we should start one of these things here, all right? But I am far too lazy to organize something like this on my own. So I went to Yair and said, Yair, why don't you organize this, okay? And so he did, and uh, as a result for uh, a number, two, more than two years now, we've had an amazing run, but it all started with Rebecca. So um, she's visiting Caltech right now, and we wanted to make sure we got her to come and give a talk here, tell us about her exciting research. But before we get into her research, her backstory is very interesting as well, okay? So uh, right out of high school, she joined uh, the military, the uh, Air Force, I think, and, uh, right, I think, yes, okay, so, and she uh, then, but then not just uh, did her military duties, was taking classes at night and uh, learned a bunch of things like other languages, like Arabic, for example, and in fact, went to like nine universities, studied all kinds of stuff. But then when she went to the University of Texas, uh, eventually on the GI Bill, she wanted to do business, but they said, oh, you've got too many credit hours to do that. And so she had to pick another major. And she says, basically on the spur of the moment, she looked down the list of possibilities and picked astronomy, not really knowing what she was gonna get into, okay? Not really knowing how much physics there were, and everything else. So as she puts it, she says she failed her way through a lot of classes, but then eventually um, she started doing research and learning things and eventually uh, became a superstar. Now she has a National Science Foundation fellowship, which is the, the top kind of honor you can get as a grad student. So she's... Uh, Really a unique story and a wonderful person, and she is one of the most friendly people you ever meet and connects people together all over the astronomical world. So here she is, uh, Rebecca. Hello. Oh, that's bright. Okay. Hi. All right, so you're welcome for your Astronomy on Tap. I'm really glad that I uh, forced Andy to talk at ours. 
Um, so just before I begin, I just wanted to say Astronomy on Tap itself was started in New York City. And it actually this month just celebrated its fifth anniversary. And it's spread all over the world. And it's in, I don't even know how many cities now, somewhere on the order of 30. And Austin, <coughs> not to brag, is almost at its fourth year, um, and I think it's in 44 months in a row that we've been doing our event. And so um, we're really glad that we have been able to like have a good place to do our event, and we have a good audience that shows up. And so when Andy showed up and was like, hey, this looks really great, let's do one in Santa Barbara. And now I'm really happy that I'm here, and I go see you guys are great too, and you have a great venue and a great audience, so I'm really excited to get to, um, to experience another Astronomy on Tap. So what I'm going to talk about today is the universe in infrared. And so that's kind of a broad topic, um, but what I wanted to start with was just in general, what is infrared? And so I told a friend, a colleague of mine, that I was going to give this talk, and he was like, oh, well, have you heard the infrared song? I was like, there's a song? <laughs> <laughs> so I got tortured, so I'm going to torture you. <clears throat> and here's the song. I don't know if I have to click. This hit four? It's just the little wheel cycling, guys. <laughs> oh, you might be spared. This song you is so terrible. It's the worst thing you've ever heard. <laughs> oh, yeah, you want to sing it? You just ruined my punchline. <laughs> we, I mean, we can spare them. They don't have to suffer. I, I, okay, it's stuck in my head. It's not my fault. There's no way I'm going to sing it. I can't do it. No it. <laughs> you really don't want me to sing. It'll just make it way worse. I apologize in advance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, was this on your checklist? how it's really not worth this. <laughs> okay, to be fair, it's only like a portion of the song. There's like a full like five minute song. So if you really, really hate yourself, go ahead and look that up uh, when we're done here. <laughs> this has been hyped so much and it's not worth it. <laughs> Capturing the heat instead There is light from the sky that we can't see In the darkest parts of the galaxy With Spitzer spectrum we can detect them easily Yeah, it's not good. And that's just the chorus. And that's been stuck in my head ever since I started... Oh yeah, no, 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 no. Ever since I started writing this talk, so I thought I would share that with everyone. Um, okay, so again, all right, that was not useful. Uh, and so I was like, all right, well, I'll go to NASA's website and I'll figure out what do they have. They must have like some cool graphic to explain what infrared is and why we study it. And so I go to NASA and uh, this is their picture. <laughs> That's terrifying. I mean, it's accurate, but it's terrifying. And NASA, really? Like, that's what you've used? So, okay. So. Infrared is tracing heat signatures. So if you've ever like played a video game or you have like night vision goggles or done any of those things, you understand this concept. So uh, what you're looking at is thermal signatures, so to speak. Uh, and so infrared is longer wavelength light than what we see with our eyes. And so what you actually look at is things that are warm. And so, okay, thanks NASA, that was useless. Um, and so let me actually get my own space pictures. So <coughs> next to Google. Uh, and this is what we find. And so this is much better. Hey, look, that's actual space. 
So what we're looking at here is the in the very middle, you can see the optical image. So this is what you would see if you looked at the Whirlpool galaxy with Hubble eyes. And so this is a visible wavelength of light that we can see. But what you can tell is that that's not really sufficient to just look in one wavelength range and look at an object and say, hey, we know everything there is to know. Because what you can see is that here in the X-ray, you're looking at heated gas. And in the UV, you're looking at bright stars. In the optical, you can see all the things that we would see with Hubble. And these are the pretty pi space pictures that you've normally seen. But in the infrared, it looks totally different. What you're looking at is actually like the dust and the gas and the heated up things. And then in the radio, you're looking at the cold things. And so in order to know more about our universe, we need to actually look at things in multiple wavelengths. And so everyone's heard of the Hubble Space Telescope, built for James Webb. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> well, hang on, hang on, I'll explain. OK, so in <laughs> right now, in the infrared, what we have is the Spitzer Space Telescope. Who's heard of Spitzer? Oh, wow, that's like 20 people. OK, that's good. Um, all right, so the Spitzer Space Telescope is currently what we have that's doing infrared. And we go into space because the atmosphere actually blocks a lot of the infrared light. And so if we want to look at something, get a clear picture of it or a clear spectrum of it, we have to go into space so that the atmosphere is no longer in our way. So the Spitzer Space Telescope was launched in 2003. And it was expected to operate for about three years. And like the best case scenario, it could have worked for five years. And so right now, uh, it's still going which is pretty cool. Um, that was unexpected and very exciting. Um, but what we did is we launched Spitzer in an Earth trailing orbit, which means it's like in the Earth's orbit around the sun, and it's just falling behind Earth. So at some point, it's going to get between, the sun is going to be between Spitzer and the Earth, and it's going to be hard to communicate with it. But that won't happen quite yet. Um, so right now, um, the limiting factor on its lifetime was its ability to cool itself down. And so since we are looking at heat signatures in space, we want to make sure that the thing that's looking at heat isn't in looking at itself and the heat that it's, it's emitting. And so we cool these things down in space. Space is cold. But we also have to cool the detectors down a whole bunch if we want to look at um, some warm things in space so that we're not looking at the telescope itself. And so it ran out of some of its cryogen cooling in 2009. And so right now it's in the warm phase. And I feel obligated to talk a little bit about Spitzer because right now I am doing a fellowship at IPAC, which is the facility at Caltech that NASA owns that runs the Spitzer Space Telescope. So as I was writing this talk, I was actually in the room that has the clock that says, this is how many days Spitzer's been running. And today is its 5,364th day in operation in space. So good job, Spitzer. <laughs> so here's a little bit of an example. How many people have seen this, this picture before? Does anybody know what it is? <laughs> so this is called the Pillars of Creation. It's in the Eagle Nebula. And this is probably one of the more famous Hubble images. So the Hubble Space Telescope, again, looks in visible wavelengths of light. And so you can understand, this is where stars are forming, and you can see all there's like dust and stuff in the way, and this is where we form stars in space. And so you can understand a lot about what's going on by looking at a picture like this and looking at like where the stars are and where the dust and gas and stuff like that is. But what you're also missing is some more information. So this is what Spitzer can see. Yeah, 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 good job, Spitzer. This is actually my favorite space picture. I do nothing related to this, but this is my favorite image because look at how many more stars you're seeing. There's so much more information out there that we need other wavelengths of light to do. So I'm actually going to zoom out a little bit, and this is that same thing. So, oh, God, the screen is awful. Um, in the middle, I promised you, are the pillars. Uh, and so you can just zoom out. And what you're seeing is you're seeing all these stars, and you can kind of see the cavity that it's blown out of the gas and dust. And so this is, again, looking at visible wavelengths of light and think, oh, wow, we know a lot about what's going on. Look at these stars have carved out all the dust and stuff around them. But when we look in the infrared, there's actually so many more things that we're missing because this is the infrared picture. How cool is that? <laughs> yeah. So it's really important to have infrared telescopes if we want to know a lot more about what's going on in the universe. No, those are beautiful and lovely pictures and not at all what I do. So what I do is I use infrared to actually study the distant universe. And so instead of studying warm things that are close by and getting more information about them, I do a thing called redshift. And so who's heard of this? <laughs> Good job, Santa Barbara. 
<laughs> All right, so what happens is a galaxy that's very, very far away emits light in like blue light, say. And as the universe is expanding, because that's what's happening, the universe is expanding, it stretches out these wavelengths of light to longer wavelengths. And so blue light that's left the galaxy actually turns out to be red when it reaches us if the galaxy is far enough away. And it's taken long enough for that light to reach us. And what I particularly look at is I look at UV light from galaxies so far away that it's been stretched all the way into the infrared. And so Hubble operates predominantly in the visible wavelengths. And so it's kind of working in the infrared. And then Spitzer can also do this as well. Um, and so this happens. And the way we find these galaxies is through this dropout technique. And so when you emit light in the UV, if you look at this thing right here, this is wavelength. So short wavelengths are on the left-hand side and longer wavelengths are on the right-hand side. And then you can just look at this axis as like the amount of light something emits. And so like a 100 watt light bulb emits more light than a 40 watt light bulb. And so say like there's a zero watt light bulb and a 100 watt light bulb and they're gonna be very different. And so we expect, we know that these galaxies emit this light in a certain way that anywhere shorter of UV, they don't emit anything. And then, so we know when we see them show up, that must be the UV light that was emitted from those galaxies. But we see this happen in the infrared because that wavelength of light is stretched out so far because it traveled so long to get to us. And so I don't know if you can tell from the screen here, but you see if you take an image at this wavelength and an image at this wavelength and an image at this wavelength, you're not going to see your galaxy here or here because it's got no light that it's emitting. But you're going to see this galaxy here. So this is how I identify galaxies is um, I want to know at what point do they show up. And that tells me something about how far away they are. And so this tells me about the redshift or the stretch of these, uh, these, the light that's emitted. So how many people have seen this picture before? Does anybody know what this is? Hubble. Yeah, this is the Hubble. We got to say Hubble these days. This is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. No, I'm not, I'm not advocating for the Hubble tip jar, no. Um, it's beautiful, yes, it's beautiful. Okay, I can't hate on Hubble, to be fair, my data comes from Hubble right now. But um, what we did is we pointed the Hubble Space Telescope at a very small patch of the sky, smaller than the moon, for many, many hours. And almost everything, I mean, there might be like a handful of stars in this picture, but almost everything in this picture is a galaxy. And that's like a tiny little spot on the sky, smaller than the moon, if you look up. There's a lot of galaxies out there. And so what to me is very obvious in this picture, and I hope to you as well, is all these galaxies look slightly different. They're different shapes, they're different colors, they're different sizes. And so you can learn a lot about how galaxies form or how they evolve and over time if you can measure the distances. Because this is just a picture, but you can also get some distance information from these galaxies if you use the same technique. And so... Um, I'd point out my galaxy, but you can't see it. Um, <laughs> it's very, very, very faint and very, very tiny. Um, and so my galaxy being detected in the same way actually looks like this. So <laughs> look at how cute it is. OK, so <laughs> you can see these are visible, and the V is visible wavelengths of light. And then you get into these, these weird lettering things that we call filters. Um, but you take infrared pictures of light here in the, those those five, six, six, six to the left, uh, you see all of a sudden that pink circle is circling around where my galaxy is. So all of a sudden you see it show up. And that gives me some estimate of the distance of my galaxy. And then so if you see the far two, the two right ones are actually Spitzer. This is Spitzer images. But if you look, those two bright things in the very center are the two bright things that are very far away from my galaxy in the Hubble images. And you can tell from looking at this that Spitzer's resolution is really bad. Like, I mean, I love Spitzer, and I'm grateful for it, but that's really bad. And so what we need is we need a better telescope. And so if I want to look further back in space, I need to go into longer wavelengths of light. So things that have traveled really, really, really far stretch a whole lot. So now they're in the infrared, further red of where um, some of these other galaxies are. So when we want to study the early universe in infrared, we can use ground-based observatories, but again, the atmosphere becomes a problem. So ground-based telescopes can look probably about, it's hard to read, but six billion years in the past. And so we can look about half the age of the universe. But if you look at the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which is the third one down, you can see that this looks 
about 800 million years after the Big Bang. And so this is where my galaxy lies. It lies over 13 billion year light years away from us. That's how long ago the light left this galaxy. But if I want to understand how galaxies from the early universe evolve into the ones that we see today, we need to understand when those first galaxies were formed. And those first galaxies were formed here at the bottom. You see this arrow that goes all the way to about 200 million years after the Big Bang. It's almost 13 and a half billion years ago. And Hubble can't reach that far, so we need the James Webb Space Telescope. <coughs> 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 And why? Why is this so great? So this is the James Webb Space Telescope. Well, not the actual thing. This is like this live, full-scale model of it. And I'm partial to this picture because that's Austin <laughs> in the background. So they brought it to this film music festival called South by Southwest, and they put it out on the, on the lawn, and then like there's the river in between it and downtown. And this is a beautiful image that somebody took of the full-scale model. And it's hard to tell, but there are little people there at the bottom for scale. Um, so this telescope is scheduled to launch in 2020. Uh, <laughs> um, so hopefully that happens. And um, it's expected to run for about five and a half years. And it could run, I mean Spitzer ran for much longer. And its limiting factor isn't it actually its coolant, it's its fuel. So it's gonna go to L2, which is about a million miles past the moon, and then it's gonna orbit around that position. And so the amount of fuel that you use on launch and the amount of fuel that you use moving it around is actually what's limiting its lifetime. Because if you lose the ability to move it, you actually lose the ability to point and navigate. And so hopefully that'll work out great. This thing is big. It's about the size of a tennis court. So if Hubble is the size of a, like a bus, then this is the size of a tennis court. And so again, this is probably a better picture. These are people to scale. This is the actual telescope. This is not the live scale. This is the actual mirror segment of the telescope at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. And so they were putting it all together. And currently, it's here in California. It's at the Northrop Grumman facility outside LA. And they are putting it together with the spacecraft. They're <laughs> yes. <laughs> I did this talk before, and it was in Houston. I was like, guys, it's in Texas. And I was like, yeah. And now I'm like, guys, it's in California. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, it's exciting. <laughs> Vote for this one. Um, okay, so, <laughs> so this telescope, um, it won't launch for a while. <laughs> um, <laughs> we don't want to talk about that. Um, and so I'm actually part of a team. My advisor at UT Austin led a program proposal for an early release science survey, which is like the first people who get to use this telescope besides the people that helped build it. And so this is called the Cosmic Evolution Early Release Science Survey, and I can't be more excited because I get to be one of the first people to get data back from this telescope. So we are gonna be one of the first teams of people to look at the first galaxies that form with this amazing telescope that launches really soon. <laughs> so what is, what, why, okay, that's great. We can do amazing science with this. But just to show you a visual, so Hubble's amazing. I really can't hate on Hubble, although like I have preference for James Webb at this point. Because if this, at the very top, is one of those galaxies in this Hubble deep field, and you zoom in and it's kind of a blurry mess, but you know, I mean, it's there and you can tell it's blue and it's kind of swirly. But if you look at the bottom, <laughs> I'm screaming it doesn't help. Um, you can look at the bottom, you can actually see structure with James Webb. So looking at that same galaxy for that same amount of time, you know so much more information about it and you can do actual measurements about how fast it's spinning and what it's made out of and all these kinds of things. And so being able to look at these early galaxies with the same resolution as Hubble, but you need a longer wavelength requires this giant telescope. And so the best part about this telescope is that it's basically a transformer. So it's so big, you can't easily put a tennis court in a rocket. I mean, rockets are big, <laughs> it's really big. So what we have to do is fold up this telescope. We're gonna fold it up and then stuff it in a rocket, and then we're gonna launch it into space, and then it's gonna unfold itself as it travels a million miles past the moon. And then it's gonna do amazing groundbreaking science that we haven't been able to do because we need a big telescope that works in the infrared that's in space. And so this is super exciting, and please pay attention to all of the things going on about James Webb, because I cannot be more happy to be part of the teams that get to use this telescope. So I'm gonna stop, and I'm gonna take questions, or there's a break or something, and, um, and I'm gonna play this video for you. So this is the, oh, this one worked. Um, 
So this is the video of the telescope unfolding as it journeys a million miles past the moon. So we'll take this one. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, we'll leave this video playing during the five-minute break. And in the meantime, text your questions to 805-55-AOTSB. And then after this is done, uh, we'll have Rebecca back and take questions. We got a lot of really, really great questions. Um, more than we can probably do. So thank you for sending your questions. Uh, remember, if we pick your question, go see Sandy in the front desk to get a prize. If we don't pick your question, I apologize. Uh, but remember, you can ask anyone with a star pin and, and also talk to Rebecca after. Don't ask the hard ones, OK? OK, so we're going to start here. If we could see the night sky from Earth, with the same infrared sensitivity as Spitzer, what would be the brightest and most awesome things in the sky? <laughs> <laughs> well, so I mean, the sun would still be the brightest. It is the closest, and it does emit infrared light. It is warm. You just go outside, and you can feel it. Um, and the moon, again. But the Earth itself emits heat. So you'd be really, really... Um, confused <laughs> because what you would see is you'd see the heat from the earth so the earth itself has a temperature that is in the infrared and so this is also part of the reason why we want these infrared telescopes not to be near the earth or to be blocked from it and so I'm sure a lot of the things that you would see is actually the earth's heat itself plus the sun and the moon and everything else would probably be too faint compared to those things since those are the closest and the warmest yeah, yeah, and you, you've also seen how dogs would look like, so not a, not a pleasant... <laughs> you just don't want that kind of eyes. Not a pleasant world. Okay, um, someone asked, so you mentioned Spitzer was designed to work for three years, the optimist said five years, and it's been 15 years. Why are we always so wrong about these things, and they end up working so much better than anticipated? I would rather be wrong in that way <laughs> than I'm wrong in the other way. Um, so there's certain specifications that they have to meet for these things to get launched into work. And so the specifications required at least three years. So like worst case scenario, this telescope's gonna run for three years and give us data. I mean, the idea was they made it to last for longer than that, but because space is dangerous and because space is a complicated thing to actually operate stuff in, you can't always prepare for anything that's gonna happen. And so because the cryogen was actually the limiting factor on a lot of the instruments on the telescope, in 2009 when that ran out, they assumed that the telescope wouldn't be able to really run anymore. But because some of the detectors didn't have to be cooled as much as other ones, we still can use about half of the detectors on this telescope. And so it's really cool that we still get data from it. In fact, being at Caltech, um, at IPAC, which is the facility that runs Spitzer, they actually just did their final, maybe, hope, mm, they expect to be their final call for proposals to use this telescope. They put out the request for scientists to be like, this is your last opportunity. Spitzer is going to get too far away from us and the sun is going to be in the way. This is your last chance to use this telescope. What do you want to do with it? So everybody at IPAC was really sad. <laughs> they actually like, had a bunch of alcohol after the deadline and were <laughs> like, well, bye Spitzer. Like, this has been great. Um, but then there was also people who were like, well, maybe it'll keep going. So. You're always hoping, right? We can hope for more, but we plan for less. So you kind of answered this already, but um, how, you know, you mentioned how that Spitzer ran out of coolant. How can we still use it uh, if it's now warm and emitting its own infrared light? So certain detectors have to be colder than other ones. So um, depending on the, the instrument itself, so the telescope is like a mirror and then some stuff that focuses the light. Uh, and then there's instruments that are on it that are the things that actually take the data. So Two, two of the wavelengths that Spitzer can do, the two that I have actual data from, are the two that don't need to be as cold um, because they're shorter wavelengths. So those two are still running. Okay, so given the risks of space launches, would it be better to do 10 launches of 10 small telescopes rather than one big, super risky, put all your eggs in one basket, expensive, you know, all of the future of astronomy depends on single launch. I may have changed the phrasing of that question. You might be slightly <laughs> biased in that question because um, I don't know how many billions of dollars James Webb is now, but um, I would rather have that telescope than a bunch of tiny ones. Um, it really depends. It depends on what you want to do with the science. So the reason we have such a big telescope and it's such an expensive endeavor 
It's because to get the same resolution that Hubble does at longer wavelengths, you need a bigger mirror. And it's really hard to put bigger mirrors into space. I mean, you could probably build one on the moon and that would be amazing. Um, but those kinds of things require a lot of money and R&D and it takes time. James Webb has been in development for um, 20 years or something like that. It's not even launched yet. So it depends on what you want to look at. If you need infrared information, you need high resolution, you need a big telescope, and you need to get out of the atmosphere. So that's just going to cost more money. Smaller telescopes can do shorter wavelengths and are probably cheaper to launch, um, but they do different science. So it really depends on what you want out of them. Okay, so there was another uh, nice question, which was how uh, do you know whether a galaxy is one of these ultraviolet, very redshifted distant galaxies, or if it's a more nearby, just intrinsically red galaxy? Did you ask that question? No, no, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. But uh, now that I see it, actually, I want to know what the answer is. <laughs> so this is uh, complicated. So I found this galaxy, right? I confirmed this galaxy, and then I spent twice as long convincing myself and everyone else that it was what it was and it was not a closer, redder thing. And so galaxies emit light at certain wavelengths and they emit certain amounts of it. So in the UV, this galaxy is really bright, but in the infrared, it's even brighter. And so you know, <laughs> you know what to expect the galaxy to look like, given what we see close by and we have really good data for. And so I think my galaxy is a certain really distant thing because I have really deep data at one of the shorter wavelengths and I don't see it. And so because the change in the amount of light emitted at different wavelengths changes based on the composition of the galaxy, if it had been a sh closer, redder galaxy, I would have seen it in that filter. But it's not. Okay, good answer. Okay, last question for you here. Oh, God. <laughs> Who was James Webb? <laughs> Not the best person to name a telescope after. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> this is why we shouldn't name them before they launch. But um, so James Webb was a previous administrator of NASA. Um, and so they decided, hey, this would be a great homage to him to name this telescope after him. He did a lot of great things. Turns out he wasn't a great guy. Um, and so recently this has come to light that maybe like not the best person to name things after, but literally everything says J2ST now. So now instead of calling it the James Webb Tape Telescope, most of NASA is trying to just call it the Webb Telescope and then hope people don't guess what that means. <laughs> okay, okay. You've all heard that. Um, okay, so let's thank Rebecca again for a great talk. Thanks, guys. And it is now time for Astronomy in the News, where we break down the latest astronomy stories that appeared in the news and see if they got it right and what they mean. And uh, Andy's going to get us started here. Is that right? All right, here we go. Okay. Um, I should say, before we get started, that... Uh, Yair was not supposed to host tonight. He was just supposed to give a talk, but uh, Curtis, the other person who was supposed to host, got sick. So Yair stepped in at the last minute and had to, had to learn all these stories. All right, but uh, I know Yair will do a great job anyway because he's amazing. All right, so uh, first uh, story. Gaia is a satellite that's been observing stars for a little while and just had the first data release. Now this sounds boring. What's a data release? It means they, they got tons and tons of data over years and released it to astronomers. Um, so this is what the satellite looks like. This is a fake image here of, you know, it's out in space somewhere. But to give you a sense of scale, that little silver, like it looks like a belt buckle on the pilgrim's hat there, is about the size of a person, okay? And it's been rotating around and taking data, so we'll see a little movie explaining what it's doing. In order to better understand the Milky Way, its past and its future, the Gaia spacecraft has been surveying the skies since 2014, and it will make up to 70 observations on average for each star over the five-year mission. 
The first data release in 2016 charted 1 billion stars, but only included the distance and motions for 2 million. The second release has now updated this to an extraordinary 1.7 billion and with greater accuracy, including the distance and motions for nearly all the surveyed stars. This new image, showing the distribution of stars in the Milky Way, represents 22 months of observations. The dark areas are not empty. They contain interstellar gas and dust and are often regions where new stars are forming. This stunning new image was produced by recording the colour from stars and combining it with their overall brightness. We now know the position and brightness of 1.7 billion stars. Importantly, as well as the colour, we also know the distance and proper motion of 1.3 billion stars, plus the surface temperature of 161 million, the radius and luminosity of 77 million and the radial velocity of 7 million stars. Okay, so what does all that mean? Well, the positions of stars are very fundamental to the way we do astronomy. If you can record the positions very accurately, you can get something called parallax, which tells you how far away the star is, or what uh, here they're saying radial velocity, that's how far away it's moving away from you or towards you, or proper motion, which is how it's moving on the sky. And so this is giving us absolutely unprecedented information on tons of stars that we've never had before, and in fact, those pictures that you saw of the whole Milky Way there were not actually pictures. Like in the sense of somebody took a digital image of that and then there you're done. No, those were actual positions of stars with the actual color information of the star colored together. So it's like if you built a picture together from 1.7 billion points of light, that's what that was. But it goes way beyond that. They then released all of this information with the velocities of the stars to astronomers in the last few days. And astronomers have been doing an incredible job of then now writing papers. So we're just starting to get the tip of the iceberg of the science that's coming out. I'll give you one example. Uh, a friend of ours, uh, Ken Shen, uh, just wrote a paper and put it on the archive yesterday. And remember, this is less than a week after this data has been available, testing one of his theories. He's a theorist about how type 1a supernovae work. So I won't go into all the details of that. Maybe we'll have it at a future Astronomy on Tap, but the story of how they did it is quite incredible. He had a bunch of astronomers standing by at telescopes waiting for the data release. It got released at 3 a.m. Pacific time, started looking through the data and plotting things, figured out some really cool stars that are called hypervelocity stars that are moving like a bat out of hell through the Milky Way, like unbelievably fast, so fast they should not really exist identified them, told astronomers, go look at these stars. They got a spectrum, figured out that they are white dwarf stars that match his theory about if they survive a supernova explosion, they could go shooting off into space really quickly. And it looks like that theory could be correct, okay? And then they wrote a paper in six days. So this tells you the frenzy that astronomers are in because of this amazing treasure trove of data that we have. Also, uh, they've released a thing called the uh, Gaia Sky 1.0, which is a public open source piece of software you can download and look at the data yourself. Okay, this is an example of just the positions of asteroids. So see that red line is the orbit of the Earth there. All those green lines are orbits of asteroids and they were figured out by Gaia. And uh, so we know tons more about those things. Maybe we'll talk about that at a future Astronomy on Tap as well. But the important thing is you yourself can go and play with the data. Yeah, okay, so this month we celebrated the 28th birthday of the Hubble Space Telescope. Yeah? And so it's 28 years that it's been in space and that's kind of something you want a space telescope to be in, space. <laughs> For 28 years. So these are pictures from the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, which is a place where the Hubble Space Telescope is run from. This is how they celebrated its birthday with a rocket-shaped piñata and a cake. And you had to stick one of the Hubble Space Telescope's cameras blindfolded onto the piñata. And it <laughs> you got it. You got a prize. I hope that when they really put the telescopes in the real telescopes, the astronauts did it a little bit more accurately than that. 
But um, see, that's a good metaphor there, Yair, because when Hubble was launched, it was blind, and they had to go and attach other instruments to it. So Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But then it's been producing data for the 28 years. <laughs> so uh, this is how they celebrate it internally, the team that runs it. And this is how they celebrate it publicly, is by releasing a brand new image of this Lagoon Nebula, um, which is a, a really amazing uh, uh, formation in space. So here's going to go into the Milky Way. The Lagoon Nebula is about 5,000 light years from Earth. And it's actually so big that Hubble can't capture all of it. Uh, but the parts that it can capture, it captures in really amazing detail. So what you see here um, is another, a different uh, place where stars are being born, a stellar nursery, kind of like the pillars of creation that Rebecca showed you, but this is a different one. And you see that there are all these, uh, this is all the gas that's forming the stars and the most massive, most hottest stars that are being formed emit ultraviolet radiation that actually sculpts this gas and dust into these amazing shapes um, and heats it up and makes it glow into these beautiful, uh, like cloud-looking structures. And, and some of the dark spots are, are kind of dust that you can't see through with optical light, but there are stars being formed inside of them all the time. Um, so what uh, maybe Rebecca kind of neglected to mention <laughs> is that the Hubble Space Telescope, as you see, observes invisible light, this beautiful visible light, but visible light can't penetrate through those dusty areas that are dark. Uh, but Hubble Space Telescope doesn't only observe invisible light, it also has its own infrared camera. So they actually released two images of this uh, Lagoon Nebula. One was in the optical uh, visible light, so that's the visible light image, and then one in the infrared with Hubble, because, you know, it's a telescope that does more than one thing. <laughs> 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 I don't know which one to vote for now. It's its birthday this month. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our next uh, story is about the launch of the TESS satellite. So uh, here are some amazing pictures of the launch in my home state, Florida. Uh, and these are taken by John Kraus, who is an 18-year-old. Okay. He took these stunning pictures of the launch, and it was launched by a, a rocket from SpaceX. Yeah, we said we want to invite him to Astronomy on Tap, but he won't be able to get in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but let's hear a little bit. In three years, we'll have him come. Okay. But uh, we'll, we, right now, let's hear what TESS is. Okay, here's another little video that will explain. TESS will search for these new worlds, or exoplanets, using transits, the same method as the Kepler mission. As a planet passes in front of its star, it blocks some of the light causing a slight drop in brightness. TESS can detect those subtle dips and even use them to determine some basic features of the planets, such as their size and orbit. Each of TESS's cameras has a 16.8 megapixel sensor covering a 24 degree square, large enough to contain an entire constellation. TESS has four of these cameras arranged to view a vertical strip of the sky called an observation sector. TESS will watch each observation sector for about 27 days before rotating to the next one, covering first the south and then the north to eventually build a map of 85% of the sky. This coverage, about 350 times what Kepler first observed, will make TESS the first exoplanet mission to survey almost the entire sky. All right, so the Kepler mission is responsible for two-thirds of our known exoplanets. We know about 3,500 exoplanets, and, and Kepler found about two-thirds of them. But Kepler stares at these little areas really deeply, so it can only find planets around really dim stars, stars you've never heard of. But TESS will be able to look over the whole sky and find planets around stars that you could see with your backyard telescope. But that also means we'll be able to take our telescopes and find out additional information about them. So for example, it's gonna start getting these transit data uh, quite soon, and then at LCO, Las Cumbres Observatory, we use our telescopes to go and get radial velocity information, information about the star wobbling, that then we pair with the data from TESS. And we are gonna start getting triggers in about July, 
from that and start observing from our observatory that's headquartered here. So uh, why does it take until July? Well, one reason is because it's in, in this orbit, and right now TESS is on its way to the moon, basically, and it's going to basically get this gravity assist from the moon and, and then go, go off in a slightly different direction and get an inclined orbit. So this yellow line is the orbit of the moon. It's going to get kicked up into a different orbit and, it, and be in basically a two-to-one resonance orbit with the moon. And then we'll start observing, start finding planets very soon. But uh, let's see how the launch went to see how healthy the spacecraft is. So remember, this was a launch from SpaceX. Uh, so here we have the landing <laughs> of the first stage. So that they return the first stage to Earth and try to land it. Yes, as you can hear from the applause and the video right there on your screen. The first stage has successfully landed on a fourth I Still Love You. This marks the 24th successful landing of a Falcon 9 first stage. All right, that is the landing of a robot's first stage on a robot ship. The, uh, the drone ships there are named after uh, things in Ian e M. Banks novels about these uh, spaceships that are like the size of planets that uh, name, they're so smart, they're intelligent, and they name themselves. One is called, of course, I still love you, and the other is called, just read the instructions. Uh, that's, not a, that's not a joke. I mean, that's the actual name. Okay, and so it's quite an amazing feat, but that's just getting the first stage booster back so that they can reuse it. The second thing is launching the uh, actual spacecraft from the upper stages of the rocket, and so here it is in Earth orbit, and now that remember beautiful image of the Earth behind like us this, there. And it was Elon Musk's Tesla. One of the planets Tesla's going to look at in okay. its lifetime. But this is an actual spacecraft. And as you can see there, we have had successful okay. separation it of the Tess spacecraft. Far more and it's going on on its beautiful mission to look at thousands of planets outside of our that, solar well, system. The, the extrasolar planets that are all out there. Okay, so. Um, that is a great feat, and uh, reports are that it is functioning, functioning normally, and so we should get data in July. Yep. So that, that launch happened a, a week or two ago. There is a launch that is going to happen this Saturday. Yeah. So this is going to be a mission to Mars that is going to be launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base, not far from here. Yep, and so you can all go watch it. It's the first ever interplanetary launch from Vandenberg or from anywhere other than Florida. So this is the first time they're launching an interplanetary mission from here. So it's a historic event. Um, the only issue is it's gonna, the uh, launch window starts this Saturday at four in the morning. Uh, so you have to be committed if you wanna see this. Uh, but if you do, you can drive to Lompoc, and there are two official viewing areas at Lompoc Air Airport and at this church where you can, you'll have, you know, they'll, they'll be showing, live streaming the launch, and of course you'll be able to see it from about 10 miles away. Uh, you actually feel a launch at that distance in addition to seeing it. Um, and uh, there will be members of that mission uh, there to tell you about what it is. Now, Four in the morning is not the best time to go you know, see a launch, but it is actually pretty neat because if it launches in the right time in the window, what happens is it's still dark down here on Earth because the sun hasn't gone up yet, but it is bright up where the rocket is. So all of the rocket exhaust and fumes uh, get lit up by the sun against a dark sky. And it's a really beautiful thing. Here's one that happened a few months ago that we told you about, and it flew over LA and freaked everyone out because they didn't know what it was. But that is a rocket launch when, when it's in sunlight and you're still in darkness down here. So if that happens, you know, if it happens at the right time this time, uh, that's what you can see and it's really beautiful and worth seeing. So it might be worth getting up at four in the morning to watch it. You could go to Lompoc to see it, but you will also see it from Santa Barbara and actually, depending on the time that it launches, you could see it across the entire southern coast uh, down to San Diego as well. So what are they sending into space? Uh, they're sending this uh, InSight mission, which is a little robot um, that's going to go in it to Mars. And I think here's a little video that explains what is it going to do on Mars. 
InSight carries a seismometer which measures the seismic waves that have traveled through Mars from Mars quakes and maps out the deep interior structure of Mars. We're going to also have a heat flow and physical properties probe which will penetrate into the Mars surface about 5 meters or 16 feet to take the temperature of Mars. And it has a, a radio science experiment which uses the radio on the spacecraft to measure small variations in the wobble of Mars's pole to understand more about the structure and composition of the core. InSight will be the first mission to pick instruments up off the deck of the lander and place them on the surface of Mars. I like to say that we're playing the claw game on Mars with no joystick. The seismometer needs to be installed in one place and basically not move in order to get the best seismic data. We also have a wind and thermal shield that will then be placed on top of that seismometer to protect it further from the environment. For the heat flow probe, HP cube, it also needs to sit in one place, take a while to hammer itself down into the ground and acquire the thermal measurements over a long period of time. Okay, so as you saw, this is gonna actually study the inside of Mars for the first time by digging into it and by putting this seismometer that can measure earthquakes or rather Mars quakes. Um, and using those Mars quakes, you can tell what the internal structure of Mars is and that, that's never been done before. So we hope it'll be a successful and beautiful launch and it'll make it to Mars somewhere around November, around Thanksgiving, and then hopefully land and, and do all this stuff that's planned. So hitching a ride on that spacecraft are two other CubeSats, little tiny uh, satellites about the size of a suitcase that will help us communicate with Mars better. So the problem right now is you have to relay information up to something orbiting Mars and then relay back to Earth. And so there are all these communications gaps where you may not be able to get data for hours at a time. But these CubeSats called MARCO um, are going to hitch along uh, flowing right behind the spacecraft here, and they may be able to improve our communications and send us information back faster. Now, these are really cheap, and in fact, students from uh, here locally have worked on them. So uh, uh, students in San Luis Obispo have worked on these uh, satellites and are waiting for the launch, and uh, we'll try to see if this all works. Uh, it may fail, but uh, we'll learn something about how to miniaturize technology and improve communications to Mars. All right, next up, a view from a comet. Okay, now this is an interesting story because it was uh, information that was taken from this Rosetta mission, which is at this comet called, we call it Comet 67P because it's hard to explain the whole name here. Uh, I won't even try there. But uh, basically, the data is sometimes made publicly available, and then other people can go and access it and do their own images. So a person who's not a professional astronomer, who we don't even know who it is, but it goes by the twi Twitter handle Landrew79, which says, not a bot, I'm a cat, space cats and Russian people. <laughs> I don't really understand what that means, but <laughs> they produced an amazing uh, video here from the surface of a comet. Okay, so look, uh, look that, that is a real thing, okay? It's not something out of a science fiction movie. But uh, let's, let's think about what's actually going on here. So we have some cliff, some snow. It looks like it's snowing, but that's not the full picture, okay? That stuff that looks like it's raining down in the background are stars setting on this comet. So we have an alternate view where the stars are fixed and you see the comet moving. So you can see the stars staying there. Look up in the top left, you can see a star cluster coming into view. But you also see this stuff sort of raining up and down. And some of those are cosmic rays from the detector, but some of that is actual stuff coming off the surface of the comet, like the way that comets make their tails and so on. You're seeing a really localized uh, version of that. So pretty incredible. Okay, so we uh, talked a lot about the uh, solar eclipse that happened last August, the great American solar eclipse across the entire country and that some of us went to see. And uh, if you didn't see it or you missed it, you're in luck because as it happens, uh, there was a Google Street View car driving through this town in Missouri right at the moment of the eclipse. 
and it just drove through. And so you can go to actually that place in Missouri and go to Street View and walk around. And what you'll notice is as you walk around, it suddenly becomes dark <laughs> in the Google Street View and then light again. And uh, you see a bunch of neat things in this, uh, you know, you can uh, walk around and see a bunch of neat things in this Google Street View. So for example, if you look down, you'll see the shadow of like a crescent sun during the partial phase of the eclipse was captured, uh, you know, through the leaves of a tree. You see these little crescent shapes. That's because the sun was partially covered by the moon. Um, you can see people looking at the eclipse uh, as you should when this happens, instead of still driving around your Google Street View car. <laughs> so apparently a very, very um, committed Google employee <laughs> who didn't even stop for like something that a bunch of us traveled thousands of miles to see. Um, but I wonder, did, did he think it was just like the Armageddon or something? Like, did he yeah. not know? I know. I imagine around. this person being totally indifferent, just driving around. Oh, it's nighttime now. Oh, it's daytime. <laughs> Everything's <laughs> fine. Um, and the cameras are actually, they, they, if you look up from the Google Street, you can actually see the diamond ring effect of the eclipse as it happened while this person was just driving the car around. So it's really neat. Go check out this town in Missouri or just Google, you know, search for Google Street View Eclipse and walk around and see a, a bunch of other neat stuff that if you uh, miss the eclipse, you can at least experience this way. It's, it's way better than we had the movie there. Uh, yeah, you and I probably spent 30 minutes screwing around with Google Maps <laughs> yeah. today. We just go, you go to that address and it's like house that's in the light, house in the light, and then boom, house in darkness, and then you can go down different streets where it's dark and some streets where it's light. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. All right, last story here is one about uh, one of everyone's favorite planets, uh, Uranus. Uh, now, I say it that way, um, uh, Uranus as in this bathroom smells Uranus. That is the number one way to say it. Uh, the <laughs> number two way to say it is Uranus, okay? And that's the way that's relevant to this story. Um, the NASA Voyager uh, zoomed right past uh, Uranus in this image from 1986. It's the only spacecraft to visit it. But we can use ground-based telescopes to look at it. And there was a story that um, very serious scientists put in a very serious journal saying that there is hydrogen sulfide clouds in uh, Uranus, okay? Now, the media got a hold of this, and their take on it was, uh, Uranus smells terrible. There we said it. Okay, that is in Time magazine. All right, now I know that Uranus is, has been the butt of many jokes, uh, but uh, people have uh, gone even farther and said Uranus smells like farts. Okay, complete with a graphic. Now, that's from Gizmodo. We went back to the site today and they've actually changed the graphic. I thought it was too extreme. Okay, because then people are gonna think, is this a real or is this an artist's impression? I don't know. Okay, and even the venerable Canadian broadcasting company said, uh, Uranus smells like farts. Scientists confirm, <laughs> which means either they thought that was true or some other scientist said, no, I figured out Uranus smells like farts way before you did and wanted credit. Okay, either way, people on Twitter, of course, took to this and composed limericks like some science that may entertain us is news of an odor most heinous, like sulfurous farts detected in parts of air very close to Uranus. <laughs> okay, but my favorite joke, maybe, was by uh, the NASA, official NASA Voyager Twitter account, which tweets out like how many miles away it is from the sun and all, uh, and all of that, and it was the last thing to visit Uranus and said, uh, it wasn't me, okay? <laughs> But <laughs> since, <laughs> since, and it was replying to another NASA account, which says Uranus stinks, okay? But now since uh, Voyager is the only thing to have passed four gas giants in the solar system, it technically has passed the most gas of anything humans have ever created. <laughs> All right, so with that, that is astronomy in the news. But uh, one last thing is that, again, this is uh, Yair's last astronomy on tap. And uh, so everything you've seen 
All this time is because of him. And to, so to celebrate, we're going to have a cake with uh, a neutron star merger on it, which is Yair is famous for figuring a lot of cool stuff out about <laughs> that we'll hear about later. So during the break, uh, you can come get a piece of cake and uh, help us celebrate and send Yair off. This is a really nice cake. So yeah, let's uh, thank you very much. I had no idea this was happening. And let's take a break and have some cake and we'll be back in five minutes. There is cake that will still be coming out during the course of these things. It just takes a little bit of time to slice and distribute cake, okay. So, uh, but first, I am here to tell you about and embarrass Yair, all right, so. Settle down, including you, Rebecca, up on stage. Yeah, all right, you gotta stop. All right, so, uh, all right, Yair, has, you've all got to know him uh, over the last couple of years, but you only know part of the story, okay? You know him as a great presenter, organizer of Astronomer on Tap, giver of great talks, explainer of many things, but he is also, a truly world-renowned scientist, okay? Uh, one of the things he's known for is for leading a group with us at Las Cumbres Observatory, co-discovering this kilonova that you may have heard about recently of two neutron stars that merged together. But previous to that, he discovered a whole new areas of tidal disruption events, stars that get torn apart by black holes, new kinds of supernovae, all kinds of things, okay? And uh, so, in fact, he is, he, here's evidence that he is world famous, okay? Here is a Japanese TV crew that came to interview him in his off, in our offices at Las Cambrias Observatory. And uh, he's of course been in many publications around the world. We'll see some more evidence of that later, but I'm in the telling the good stories part now. Okay, so uh, in addition to being an, uh, a very acclaimed scientist, he's an amazing photographer. Okay, this is uh, a picture he took uh, while I was with him up watching the eclipse in Salem, Oregon. Okay, there is totality and then the corona that you can see right there. Here's uh, a bunch of people out here being amazed and yet he still has the foresight to take amazing, stunning photographs. And in fact, the university that we were at used this in their publications uh, later with permission. Okay, he's taken also just amazing landscape photographs. This was just him getting to a research place where he has a hotel and being like, oh, okay, I'm gonna take a picture of the sunset, boom. <laughs> and uh, we've previously shown pictures he's taken of a Rory. He takes vacations to go and take pictures of a Rory, amazing stuff. Um, but also though, okay, that's the end of the good stuff, okay? My uh, other function is to embarrass him, okay? So when he got to my research group, he said he had never seen Star Wars proudly. And I'm like, are you kidding me? What, what? How can I trust you or do anything? Well then, when we had a Star Wars event, he promptly watched all the Star Wars movies and then dressed up uh, as a Star Wars character to host the event, okay? And when I had a picture of me shaking hands with C-3PO, he's like, oh yeah? Well, I know R2-D2. I'm like, what? <laughs> Who is this guy? Whenever he finds out something, he really goes to the extreme. Okay, and we know he likes to fly around the world a lot. He always, he, on his phone, the message thing is the, the United Airlines like ding, like thing or whatever. Uh, he, he is obsessed with air travel. For Halloween, he came dressed as an airline pilot, okay, which I am not completely sure was a disguise because I've seen pictures of him online uh, learning how to fly an airplane. He claims this was a simulator that he got into in Singapore. That sounds suspicious to me <laughs> because then I see pictures of him taking these tiny little planes to exotic destinations and landing on the freaking glaciers, okay? Uh, he, he goes to these crazy places at the ends of the earth where I figured out why, it's because like Superman, he has a fortress of solitude 
that he has been hanging, yeah, he has a freaking ice house at the North Pole or something. But he also is quite obsessed with chocolate. Um, we have evidence of this. He recently went to Switzerland to learn the techniques of making chocolate. Okay, here he is making his own chocolate, which he did bring back to the observatory, and we had some of. And now, Yair famously uh, does not drink. Okay, this is why he manages this whole thing so well. Uh, <laughs> because you know I couldn't do it. But uh, a distillery opened next door to LCO this week. I am not making this up. And they have a chocolate rum. So we get, did manage to get Yair to uh, 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 have some drinks. This is a chocolate rum. Okay. This is from a few days ago. I snagged this picture. You should have seen the aftermath, but I, you know, I, I, I didn't take any pictures of that. But now, um, if you will remember, I said he is internationally famous. Uh, he has been written about in all kinds of publications all around the world, one of them being Fox News, who uh, said that <laughs> Yair uh, Arkavi is, is an astrologist, okay? <laughs> now, at the time, I thought, oh, well, come on. This is like, they're just, just Fox News getting stuff wrong, as they always do. Turns out they have a crack team of researchers that must have found this picture. <laughs> so it's a horoscope, all right? So I'm not sure they got that wrong. Um, all right, now that, that is a joke. However, it, it is the actual truth that he was in Israeli intelligence. And I, I forgot to tell you that uh, Rebecca was in uh, US intelligence. So she used to work for the NSA and he used to work for Israeli intelligence. We thought about having the tip jars be <laughs> what's better, <laughs> US versus <laughs> Israeli intelligence. Thought that would be too political for a bar. So we, we, we went with JWST versus uh, HST. But I asked him today, but she can speak Arabic. You can't speak Arabic, uh, Yair. Because he said, implied they might have been working on the same thing. And he said, he just kind of stammered and said, I need to leave now and left the office. <laughs> so. I don't know about this guy. And now, just when you think Yair is so straight-laced, there's no incriminating evidence out there about him, about, you know, how he's uh, even more fun, I asked some of his colleagues, so give me some embarrassing stories about Yair. And uh, one of them said, there are none, which itself is just weird, <laughs> okay? But another one said, well, uh, you know, this is like almost 10 years ago, or maybe between five and 10 years ago, he came into my office and just rearranged all the books so that they're facing the wrong way. <laughs> and he has left them like that ever since, this other professor. And uh, I said, okay, we got anything else? He said, well, I don't know that Yair did this, but when I was visiting Caltech, somebody covered my office <laughs> and these post-it notes and Yair is the prime suspect. Okay, so I don't know if, if he did that or not, but he seems to be the mastermind. But I will tell you this, Yair, do, like, Yair is very careful about fonts and uh, the way he presents things. And so he said, uh, so he was just on a, a panel at the National Observatories where they gave his name tag in Comic Sans, the font that Yair hates the most. <laughs> okay, so he said, Fucking Comic Sans, my last action in this committee is to basically get rid of this. Okay, which is why I have taken the liberty of uh, turning his uh, actual presentation into <laughs> Comic Sans. Okay. So <laughs> So if you want to see Yair explode, here we go. Yair. Wow. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you for leaving me some time for my talk. I don't know if I can do this. Um, that's terrible. That looked really pretty before. Oh, man. Okay, well, 
<laughs> we're going to try. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I won't look at it. That's how we're going to do it. Okay, so I want to uh, answer the question today, or try and answer the question, why even do astronomy? Why bother? Why fund it? Why do it? Uh, why spend so much time with it? And I, you know, I, I'm probably kind of preaching to the choir here, because you're all here on a Wednesday night coming to hear about astronomy. Okay, so I'm sure you know, you know, historically astronomy was used to map the Earth to navigate the oceans to tell time, great. But what you know, what has astronomy done for us lately? Um, and of course, since you're here at a bar listening about astronomy, you know that that astronomy reshapes how we see the world, how we see our place in it. It touches us, uh, touches our lives. It inspires us. It enriches our culture. So that's all great. But why should we pay for it, right? Why should we fund something like astronomy? So I want you to take a second to think to yourselves, um, how much do you think, what percentage of the federal budget do you think goes to science? So take a second to think about that, just you know, whatever number comes to mind, <laughs> what percentage do you think goes to science? And then think about what percentage you think should go to science. Okay, so how much are we spending on science in this country? You know? So here's the, here's the actual data. Percentage of the federal budget going to research and development it was actually 12% in 1965, and it is now at an all-time low of less than 4% of the federal budget going to science, and that actually includes uh, defense research and development. If you take out defense and just look at like science that's not defense-related, it's less than 2%. So less than two pennies on your tax dollars go to science. So you know, it's not like that's what's going to break the bank. Uh, but there's actually a much more worrying trend than this. Much more worrying than the amount we're spending on science is things like this. So this is the chairman of the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology saying in an article he wrote that the NSF, which is the National Science Foundation, uh, this committee, his committee oversees their budget, um, must focus research funding on areas most likely to strengthen the economy, national security, and other national priorities. Um, and this is not the only time he said something like this. A few years ago, he tried to pass a bill, ironically called the High Quality Research Act, which set criteria that the National Science Foundation should follow when deciding what research to fund, and that is that the research has to answer questions or solve problems that are of utmost importance to society, uh, not duplicative of other research projects and in the interests of the United States, and he actually wanted to make the director of the National Science Foundation sign every time they, so they re fund research that it adheres to these three criteria. Now, this really kind of demonstrates a very basic misunderstanding of how science works. Um, let's not even mention the fact that reproducibility in science is one of the most important things. We have to reproduce someone else's experiment to know that it's real so we can trust it. So actually, it is super important to fund things that duplicate other uh, research projects, because that's how we know that the results are real and that it's true and it wasn't a fluke. Uh, but there's a deeper misunderstanding here of how science works. And I think a lot of people in society have this misconception of how science works, and that a scientist will want to set out to solve a problem. Okay, a scientist wants to solve a problem. He finds a problem. He says, I'm going to use science to solve it. That's going to result in some new technology. I'm going to open a startup company and get rich and solve the problem, okay? So the first evidence against that is that we are very not rich as scientists. Um, but also, if you think, think about like the most incredible discoveries that shape our life today. None of them, none of them came from this approach of trying to solve a problem. So here's an example. Think of medical imaging today. We can see inside the body using x-rays, MRIs, CAT scans, um, none of these technologies came as a solution to trying to solve how are we going to look inside the body, right? How could you invent x-rays if you didn't even know that x-rays existed, right? It's not that they were trying to solve the problem, let's look inside the body, and it's like, oh yeah, let's use x-rays. Well, we didn't know x-rays existed because, um, <coughs> you know, we couldn't even imagine that until someone discovered it because they were curious about light and how light works. And we didn't know how an MRI, you know, we couldn't invent an MRI before we knew how electrons uh, spin. This is the key to how an MRI works. It's because someone was curious about how electrons spin 
And it turns out you can use that in an MRI to image the body. So this technology that has saved millions of lives and, and prolonged billions of lives didn't come from trying to solve that problem. It came from being curious, and it just turned out that you can use that to solve this problem. There's no way you could have done that with directed research, putting scientists in a lab and telling them, figure out how to look inside the body, and they would have come up with this. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from Alexander Fleming, who in, in discovered penicillin, which is the basis of the first antibiotics and antibiotics today, who said, when I woke up just after dawn, September 28, 1928, I certainly didn't plan to revolutionize all medicine. Okay, but that's what he did. You just, you don't plan it. But it works, you know, kind of in this way on the right, where you're just curious about something. That's what motivates you. I want to understand this thing. Um, and I do research and, you know, sometimes leads to discovery, which then years later or decades later could lead to technology to solve a problem we didn't think was related in the first place. The problem with this approach is that while you're in that stage of I'm curious about something and doing research, there's always going to be someone who's going <laughs> to say, well, what difference does that make? How the electron spins? Who cares how light behaves? How will this ever matter to me? And that's a hard question because you can't answer because you don't know ahead of time what it's going to do. Uh, but one of the best answers came from J.J. Thompson who discovered the electron. And he after he discovered the electron, the story is he went to a bar and raised his glass and said to the electron, may it never be of any use to anybody. <laughs> Seriously, the electron. Can we imagine any aspect of modern life without electricity? Try to think of anything you did today that would have happened without electricity. Um, even more extreme than that, okay, mathematicians. Mathematicians are like, we're not even going to try and do something with the physical world. We're just going to think of all these uh, neat abstract structures in our head and figure out what happens to them. And G.H. Uh, Hardy was not just any mathematician. He was a number theorist, which is like the most abstract mathematician dealing with how numbers behave and how, why are numbers prime and how do prime numbers appear. Uh, and why do they do that? And he even said, he wrote this book called The Mathematician's Apology, saying like, this is never ever gonna be useful. There's no way. He said maybe some of the applied mathematics will become useful in an unexpected way someday, but he actually said that's why he chose number theory, because he was sure there's no way number theory will ever be useful to anyone. So I wonder what he would think of today if he knew that every time you do a transaction online or use your credit card, it's encrypted, using an algorithm that relies on knowing how prime numbers behave, or on the fact that we cannot decompose numbers into their prime components. And this, there would be no e-commerce at all if we hadn't had number theorists. So everything that drives the economy today uses this encryption algorithm that relies on prime numbers. So it, it is ironic that you know, he chose that because he was sure it would never be practical, and it, again, we cannot imagine t modern life without it. So I think these examples also demonstrate that even the scientists themselves working on these discoveries and being curious and doing research have no idea where it's going to lead. Okay, So this last stage of getting to technology is very hard to predict, and it can sometimes take decades or 100 years, um, <laughs> and sometimes doesn't happen. So it, this is what makes it very challenging. Um, and so it's not just... Uh, you know, modern life that came from the discovery of the electron or, or encryption that came from the discovery of the who enters into number theory. There are so many examples. Um, we have Wi-Fi because someone was curious about exploding black holes and that led to the invention of Wi-Fi. There's a cancer treatment that came because someone was curious about the composition of the sun and that led to this revolutionary cancer treatment. Um, DNA sequencing we have because someone was curious about some slime in Yellowstone. Um, we have LCD screens because someone's trying to refine cholesterol from carrots, <laughs> okay? I'm glad the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee didn't have to approve that research statement because they would have not, and we would have not had flat screens or thin screens. And I'm not even talking about the spin-off technology that comes just from NASA trying to build better telescopes and launch stuff into space. 
I will hand it to the James Webb Space Telescope that has to be so accurate and so precise that the techniques developed to refine its mirrors are now used in eye surgery um, to help people see better. Okay, so, but, okay, that's, you know, you're working with the physical world, you're discovering the electron, obviously something good's gonna come of it. How is astronomy ever gonna be useful, you know? So, of course, it's nice to be able to launch stuff into space, like communication satellites. Um, we need astronomy to be able to do that correctly. Uh, it's nice to know what the sun is doing, because that affects life on Earth. And it's also pretty nice to know what asteroids are doing, because if you don't believe in knowing what asteroids are doing, ask the dinosaurs how that worked out for them. <laughs> uh, but those are really obvious cases. That would have been too easy. I want to go to like the most abstract, esoteric, astronomical question you can think about, which was asked by Albert Einstein, what is space and time? You know, what could be more academic than that? What is space and time? How does it work? And a hundred years ago, he came up with a theory, which we call the theory of relativity, that explains that space and time are like this invisible grid uh, that determines the distance between two points. And if you have a massive object in this space, it'll distort that grid. It'll make it shift. It'll change the distance and the rate of time between two points and cause things to move differently. So the Earth orbits the sun and the moon orbits the Earth because each of these massive objects distorts space-time around it and causes the other object to move in this distorted space-time. And that's what we perceive as gravity, but what's actually happening behind the scenes is space being distorted. Uh, we actually talked about this a few times at Astronomy on Tap, but what I'm not sure if we told you is that, you know, okay, how is this ever gonna be useful? Well, if you wanna know where you are, using GPS, you need to launch these GPS satellites into space and they are orbiting the Earth and they are at a different distance than the Earth from the Earth as you are and they're moving at a different speed than you are. So the theory of relativity tells us that their clocks are ticking at a different rate than yours are. And that's GPS relies on very accurate timing. So if you wanna know where you are using GPS satellites, if you wanna find your way to Matrix on a Wednesday night, or if you want your pilot on your plane to find their way to your destination, they rely on these very accurate GPS signals, which would totally never work if we didn't know the theory of relativity. So if we did not know this, the clocks on the GPS satellites would tick at a different rate than we could calculate, and GPS would never work. Uh, it would tell you you're like 40 miles from where you really are. So this esoteric question 100 years ago about what is the nature of space and time is the basis for all of our navigation today. And that's just one example. Um, what happens if you just take the right-hand side route? Okay, some problems. You can say we wanna cure cancer, okay? The pharmaceutical companies have invested a lot on this directed research. I wanna cure cancer, I wanna cure some disease, some profitable disease that many people have so I can make money. And I'm gonna put a thousand talented people in a room and tell them you need to cure this disease and you're not leaving till you find this cure. Okay, so how did that work out for the pharmaceutical companies? Well, the pharmaceutical industry is actually in kind of a crisis now. You'd think today with science and technology booming that the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, would be approving more new drugs every year, more than ever. Well, that's not quite true. So on the left, you see the number, the bars show you the number of new drugs approved per year, and it's actually lower now than it was a couple decades ago, despite spending on developing new drugs going up. So that results in the plot on the right, the number of new drugs approved per billion dollars of research spending is actually going down, uh, and is now less than one new drug per billion dollars. And that's because of this directed research. Um, these solutions are not gonna come from the direct way, or not all of them, right? And if you totally abandon curiosity-driven and pure research, you're gonna run out of solutions like it's coming up here. So what do you say to these people who say, we need to focus on real solutions uh, to direct problems? Um, that's a good question. And you also need to think, who do you want deciding what is the research that's gonna lead to the next big breakthrough? I mean, we don't know, it's very hard to know but should it be these people who decide that? I'm not sure. So there was a former US president who actually had a really good reply to this guy. 
And he said, the remarkable thing is that although basic research does not begin with a particular goal, when you look up the results over years, it ends up being one of the most practical things government does. This was said by a certain former US president. Can you guess who? Obama. OK. You better sit down for this one. That was Ronald Reagan. <laughs> yeah. He actually started his presidency cutting almost all curiosity-driven research, but this was towards the end of his term in a radio address. He came around completely and became a huge proponent for curiosity-driven research. So, you know, he could understand the importance of this. And you said Obama. Obama actually also did uh, respond to Lamar Smith on another issue, saying this very eloquent uh, <laughs> quote. Yeah, that's another way to reply <laughs> as effectively. OK, so we really kind of need to invest in these two paths in parallel. OK, and astronomy definitely qualifies for the one on the right. We are curious about the universe. We want to understand it. And good things are going to happen. I can't tell you what it's going to be or when it's going to be. But I know that the next big discovery is going to start by someone who is now curious about something we don't think is important at all. And I just want to finish with one last analogy. Imagine you're living in the days before electricity, and everything is powered or everything is lit up by candles. There's candles everywhere. And the National Science Foundation, uh, if it existed then, uh, was told by the then chairman of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, you should invest all of your money in making better candles. You should figure out how to make candles that last longer, that cost less, that drip less, that have different colors, and that you can control how bright they are. And that will make our lives great and improve the economy, and we'll have really amazing, the best candles. OK? The one thing you should remember, though, is no matter how many billions you invest on candle research, you'll never invent the light bulb. Thank you very much. Any of, do any of you know Yair's personality? He's the, no! <laughs> Woo! Woo! Here I am saying, Yair would never do that. Full of surprises. All right. So, rem <laughs> Remember Is this still working? Yeah, okay. the text your <laughs> questions. Oh, I'm crying and laughing so hard. All right. Remember to text your questions to 805 55 AOTSB. And you got to do it quick because I'm up here trying to ask him questions. And I don't know what to say until you ask me some questions. And so then I got to read my phone, and it's a whole thing. All right. But in the meantime, I will do second surprise of the night, which is that uh, we have a little gift for Yair. Uh, for doing this this whole time. And uh, now it says, world's best astronomy on tap, which I think is true, <laughs> uh, awarded to uh, Yair Arkavi in recognition of self selfless dedication. There's a picture on here which is a telescope, the same kind that we gave away uh, previously at Astronomy on Tap, and Yair said, those look pretty good. I kind of want one of one of those. So we got one for Yair. <laughs> and uh, so that Thank will be you very much. That will be coming later, and we will demand some amazing astrophotography from that for a future <laughs> astronomy on tap uh, when he's not around. So all right, let's see what your questions are. All right. Oh, come on, people. You got you to give me some more questions. Uh, but I will, in the meantime, oh, I should tell you, what, what I've heard people ask him, well, what are you doing, Yair? Okay, I should say, he will actually be here at the next Astronomy on Tap, but because he's so dedicated to this whole craft and to everything, he's like, you guys have to run it without me, and let's just see what happens. Okay, so... <laughs> He'll, he'll be here, so you can still talk to him and ask him questions. But 
I've got <laughs> with a bunch of other dedicated people, it's going to take about a half dozen of us to replace Yair, from what I understand. So, uh, but where is he going? He will be going to Tel Aviv University as a professor in the fall and uh, starting yeah. his own thing over there. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so uh, yeah, if you're visiting Tel Aviv starting next fall, look out for Astronomy on Tap Tel Aviv, which is going to be starting. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so here's a question. I hope it's a good one. Um, well, all right, this is not, uh, how do you know what Hubble imaged are actually galaxies? And since this is Hubble related, I'm going to say Hubble champion over here, you got to tell us. Well, that, I think, was a question from the previous talk. No, it just, just came in, just came in. How do you know the Hubble images are galaxies? Well, it's actually hard to know. When you look at an image of a distant galaxy and it looks like a point, you don't really know. This is a question we have to ask. But if you, know, you can get kind of like, as if you were able to zoom in with a telescope like Hubble gives you higher resolution, you can see that it has some structure or some shape, and it has to be a galaxy. Um, also, Rebecca's technique that she told you about, if it's very red, you know it has to be very distant, which means it has to be very bright, which means it can't be one star, but it has to be a galaxy which has like 100 billion stars. So there are ways you can tell, uh, but not always. Sometimes there are objects we don't know what they are because we don't know how far they are from us. All right, how did DNA imaging come from slime? <laughs> Okay, there are a lot of stories here about how DNA imaging came from slime or how Wi-Fi came from exploding black holes or looking for exploding black holes. They were never found, but we got Wi-Fi. Um, and uh, there, uh, there are a lot of these, and actually I'm going to recommend a book. If you're interested in this, there's a book called Science Unshackled, um, which uh, is exactly these stories about how, you know, totally curiosity-driven, pure research has led to some of the most revolutionary technologies here, and that story is in there as well as all the other ones I mentioned, which I got from that book. So I'm just gonna let you read that book because it's a, it's a long story. Okay, uh, what esoteric science pursuit do you think will be the most relevant? Oh, well, yeah, I just said we can't know, and it's very hard to know, but imagine, you know, J.J. Thompson said the electron, the most useless, may it never be of use to anyone, Imagine what will happen when we figure out what dark matter is, or even dark energy, right? This is like, we can't even imagine, I think, the revolution that will come from that will be even bigger than the revolution that J.J. Thompson couldn't have imagined by inventing the electron. So there are so many things, so many, every place there's an open question about the universe, there's going to be something really neat that's going to come out of it. I don't know what it is, I don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to be really wonderful. Uh, will you go and give this talk to Congress? <laughs> <laughs> well, this, like, I'm not a, I'm not a <laughs> citizen here, so it's kind of your problem. <laughs> but uh, sure, I'd be happy to if, if, you know, I could get the security clearance to get in there. Yeah. Well, you'll just have to elect a better... Um, uh, person from your country who can come and talk to somebody from our country. <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, uh, what happens in the inside of neutron stars, and what happens when they merge together? Oh wow, that that yeah. was a cake-related question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I haven't actually finished my piece of cake that's under the neutron star, so I don't know exactly what's inside. Um, and actually, no one really knows what's inside of neutron stars. This is one of the things we're trying to answer by watching what happens when they smash together. And we've seen this happen once last year, and they smashed together, and they produced gravitational waves, and they produced light, and we were able to catch all of that, and we're actually still arguing what it means. Uh, but um, they actually, one of the things that happens is they produce the heaviest elements in the universe. So if anyone has a piece of gold, here on them, a piece of jewelry or something. The atoms, the gold atoms in that piece of jewelry were forged by the collisions of two neutron stars in a you know, long time ago. Uh, so we know that now. We didn't know that before August, and now we know that. Um, so a lot of high energy stuff is going on. A lot of it we cannot understand or calculate, but we're now just starting to observe it. We saw the first one last year. We're gonna see 10 more next year, because these detectors are gonna have, be much stronger. 
And maybe someday that will lead to some technology that we can't even imagine. Uh, all right. What is your favorite discovery you've been a part of? Oh. Mm -hmm. My favorite discovery, well... Yeah, how can you pick a favorite? They're all fun. <laughs> if you discover something new about the universe that wasn't known a day before, that's pretty fun. And when it happens a lot, I think that means you're very fortunate uh, to be working in a field with the right time and the right people and the right equipment to be able to do that. So I can't pick a favorite. They're all my favorite. All right, well, there's obviously a balance on how we should spend directed versus undirected research. So what's your... What do you think the balance should be? Yeah, that's a great question. It shouldn't, you should never like do only one thing extreme. To the extreme, you should balance, that's true. And this kind of ties to the question to how many times like does the curiosity path fail, right, for every time it succeeds? And the answer to that is a whole lot to one, okay? It, it, this is what we do as scientists. We fail all the time. We go to the lab or we go to our observatory or we go to our office and we fail. And we fail in the morning and we fail in the afternoon and then we go home and we come back the next day to do it again. Um, and once in a while, we succeed. Uh, so you really, if you want to be a scientist, you really have to know how to fail well and not take it to heart because that's what we do. So these, it's really hard to quantify because we really don't know how much we're going to invest on this curiosity path, and it's not going to lead to anything. But once in a while, we discover the electron, or we find a cure for a certain type of cancer, or we can image the human body, or we can get your location any place on the planet within seconds. And so I think even if it's a whole lot to one, it's worth it. All right, last question was, what's your favorite uh, astronomy on tap related memory? And uh, I will start by saying I, I, it's hard to know because there's so many good ones. But I would say maybe the first astronomy on tap was just the idea that, hey, this could work. You know, we can uh, draw a crowd in Santa Barbara. We had a huge turnout for even never having done this before. So hey, there's a big community out there that will uh, support uh, us just talking about the stuff that we do all day. OK, but uh, now that question I'm going to pitch to you. Yeah, no, that I will agree with that because when we started Astronomy on Tap and had our first event, I told Andy, I don't know if anyone's going to show up. If 30 people come, I'll be happy. Okay, and we got 150, and since then we've had events with 250 and 270. My favorite moment of Astronomy on Tap is every, every time we start and we see all of you come here um, and enjoy coming here and come back again, and, and we're like, okay, it's not 30 people, it's 200, so we're doing something right, so that's my favorite moment. All right. I agree with that. And I will say, out of astronomy attacks around the world, some have gotten 400 people, but usually those are in cities that have like a million people. Yes, Austin is one, and uh, Toronto is another, but per capita, we are by far the strongest. Uh, so, uh, all right. So that, that will be it for the questions. Now stay around for a raffle. Uh, let's, let's do it. All right. Okay, so let's show you what we're giving away. We are giving away four of these beer glasses that say Astronomy on Tap Santa Barbara on them. You cannot get them anywhere. Um, and so do we have the, do we have the raffle tickets? Okay. Yep. So get your raffle tickets out. Look at the number. We're going to read out a number here. So Rebecca's going to go first. And if we read your number, you have to come down here and claim your glass. Or else, oh, we need the results of the. OK. So we're, we're g before we do the raffle, we're going to do the results of the uh, tip jars here. Let's see what we got. Oh, wow. It is a huge win. For JWS team. <laughs> <laughs> James Webb wins. Okay, let's hope it actually gets off the ground and does something. <laughs> okay, first beer glass of the evening. And remember, if we call your number, let us know you're here and come get your beer glass, or we will give it to someone else. 040847. 847, are you here? If you don't make a noise, we're going to go on, move on and give it to someone else. Okay, no 847. 769. 
Wow. 769 appears not to be here. Loser. <laughs> uh, Keep going. Yeah. All right. Uh, 762. 762, are you here? No. Keep, keep going. Yeah. So do I win? Yeah, uh, yeah, well, you will get one. Uh, speakers, I should say, get uh, a beautiful glass. Uh, 870. 870, are you here? No, keep going. Yeah, we've right. never had this long of a streak. Um, Pick a good one. 906, this is a winner. I can feel it. 906. Are you here, 906? No. Nine yeah. o who? Uh, no, I guess not. Wait, up uh, there? No. Uh, she said change it to something else. Oh, no, no. Uh, oh, wait, oh. right here. 906. Congratulations. Uh, there you go. Okay, next one. Also, yeah, it can take people a long time to get down, so shout out when you could. Uh, I'll get it later. Uh, 942. 942. Yes. 942 is up there. Excellent. Big winner. Okay, we're going to give you your beer glass as soon as you get down here. There you go. Sure. Okay. And uh, 866. 866? Hey. Ah. Yeah, so Roger go. here, I should embarrass him by saying he wrote the textbook that I'm teaching in my class. Uh, that has nothing to do with the fact that he won a but beer yeah. glass. <laughs> but, it, but it is not rigged, I swear. Well, you can see us doing the whole process here. That was 866? Yep. All right. Uh, what do we last got? Last one. Wait, is this our last? Last? No, we have two more. Two more. Okay. Is that, but is one of them the astronomy on no glass? No, no, no. We have two more. That's okay, two, okay. Like two glasses. All right, all right. Yep. Uh, but we have to give one to someone here, though, don't we? Yeah, uh, uh. We have one more glass. Yeah. All right, thank you. Last thank one. You. Last yeah. one. It's hard to do calculations. Yeah. This time. <laughs> and they say, <laughs> I'm the one that drinks. All right, uh, 9.55. 9, 5, 5? No, nope. doesn't Apparently sound not. like it. Yeah, yeah. Next, next. Let's see, 848. All right, right here. All right. You're welcome. Okay. That is our raffle for tonight. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for all the surprises and the neutron star cake and the telescope. And let's thank Yair for making all of this happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming, and even though I will no longer be organizing Astronomy on Tap, you should still continue to come, and our next one is going to be on June 6th, so hope to sure. see you all there. I, on behalf of Matrix, well, my voice is very deep, I'd like to thank Yair. He's uh, been a great host since the beginning. He's been with us very loyally from the beginning, so we would like to thank you. On behalf of Matrix, thank you so much. Let's give him his cake. Make some noise one more time for you, and um, you got me. There's no, I don't have a song for him, uh, for his cake. We can sing Happy Earth Day if you want. <laughs> Happy Earth Day to you. Happy Earth Day to you. Happy Earth Day to you. you. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you to The Matrix for hosting And thank us. you, Sandy, for cutting the cake. Oh, my God, it was rough. See you next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>